How can you get better at remembering to do stuff? Today, we're talking about prospective memory. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome to Sci vs. Sci. Oh man, it seems like there was something I was supposed to do today, but I can't remember what it was. Do you ever have this problem? If so, you're experiencing a failure of a special kind of memory called prospective memory. The ability to remember you're supposed to do something in the future. Maybe you forgot to pick someone up at the airport on Saturday, and today you have to remember to pick up some apology flowers on your way home. Maybe I ask you to hit the like button and subscribe, and you think, oh, I'll definitely do that later at the end of the video. But we both know you're going to forget to do that, which sometimes might make me cry every time. So many of the things we do involve planning and then having to delay an action until later. Joking aside, this is a critical skill. Forgetting to pay an important bill, forgetting to turn off the stove, or forgetting to check for your child in the backseat of a car can have serious life-changing consequences. And as much as we like to think we are infallible, just like other forms of memory, prospective memory isn't perfect and everyone makes mistakes. So what does the science say about how prospective memory works and what can we do to make it function better? First, let's talk about the reliability of prospective memory. Out of all types of everyday memory failures, 50 to 80% are prospective memory failures. Still, when people hear about cases in which parents have forgotten their baby in a car, they are often quick to judge and find it hard to believe that you could forget something as important as that. Something that matters to you personally that much. Well, that's the question Rose, Doolin, and O'Rear 2021 wondered as well. A quick note, unlike most research we present on Sci vs. Sci, this one is a preprint and has not yet undergone peer review, and it hasn't been accepted by a journal. But given its relevance and its approach, I thought it was still worth presenting in spite of that. These researchers wanted to see if people had a personal investment in a task, if they would be more likely to remember to do it than if they didn't have a personal connection. Furthermore, they wanted to know if prompting the person to remember to do something later made them more likely to do it than if they had to remember it on their own. That is, explicitly encoding a prospective memory versus allowing the person to do it in some sort of automatic or implicit way. To do this, they had people come to the lab to participate in an unrelated experiment. When the participant arrived, they had the person give the researcher their cell phone, something they definitely don't want to forget to get back at the end. At the same time, the researchers attached a little activity tracker to the participant's back, which the participants were not personally invested in. The participant went on to do whatever tasks the researcher needed them to do. At the end, the researcher debriefed them, thanked them, and led them to the door to the hallway. They then measured whether the person forgot to get their cell phone, forgot to return the tracker, or both. If the person made it all the way to the stairwell and still hadn't remembered, they had someone there waiting to say, did you forget something? And send them back to the lab to have another chance at remembering. So what did they find? Well, about 5-7% to of the participants forgot their phone, and about 17% forgot to return the tracker. That means a lot of people fail to remember their phone, even though it's something personally important for them to remember. A second group of participants were explicitly told at the beginning, hey, don't forget to get your phone on the way out. Turns out that didn't make any difference whatsoever. The people who did remember couldn't point to a specific cue that helped them remember. Instead, they said, well, it just sort of mysteriously popped into my mind. So it seems like there's some kind of memory process running outside of conscious awareness, sort of running in the background, that's keeping track of your prospective memory tasks. And this process doesn't necessarily rely on explicitly encoding a memory to do something. In order to form a prospective memory, there are generally four steps that need to be taken. First, you have to encode the memory. Take the memory and put it in the brain, translate it into neural signals. Then, you have to be able to store or retain that memory for some amount of time, which we call a retention interval. At some point, you need to be able to retrieve the memory from storage, and then you can execute or carry out the behavior. If any of these steps are interrupted, you're likely to forget to click that like button, or whatever that prospective memory task was. Studies have shown that there are many factors that can increase the risk of prospective memory failures. Sleep deprivation, stress, distractions, and multitasking can all disrupt prospective memory. If you don't have some kind of cue to remind you, or if the task you're trying to remember requires deviation from a well-established habit, like 
remembering to stop at the grocery store for milk today when you drive that route every day without stopping. Those are conditions that are especially likely to lead to you forgetting. While many brain areas are involved in memory, there are some that stand out as especially important in prospective memory. The frontal and parietal lobes are highly involved in organizing and planning behavior, and the hippocampus is critically involved in storing those memories. But well-practiced behaviors that become more automatic the more you do them, which psychologists tend to call habits, those are less dependent upon the hippocampus. Instead, the basal ganglia takes on a bigger role in those behaviors. Normally, we switch between these two types of memory system to engage in more active thinking or more automatic behavior based on the task at hand. But these two systems sometimes compete for control of the behavior. And if you're in basal ganglia autopilot mode, that can interfere with your ability to activate the hippocampal memory to do something different today. Prospective memory can have clinical significance too. A number of disorders are characterized by issues related to prospective memory. For example, the DSM-5 criteria for ADHD mentions losing things and being forgetful in daily activities. So could ADHD be a problem of prospective memory? Yang et al. 2019 explored prospective memory in kids diagnosed with ADHD. They wondered whether decreases in attention over time might also disrupt prospective memory performance. In their study, they looked at three different kinds of prospective memory cues. Event-based cues can be things like people or places, like remembering to say thank you to someone the next time you see them. Time-based cues have to happen at a certain time, like remembering you have a Zoom meeting with your professor on Thursday at 1 p.m. Activity-based cues involve something that happens next after you do one thing, like turning off the light when you leave a room or logging off of a computer when you leave a computer lab. So to study this, the researchers had kids with or without an ADHD diagnosis play a computer fishing game where they had to catch as many fish as possible during a limited time. During the task, they had to remember things using different prospective memory cue types. For example, they had to remember to feed a cat every one minute, a time-based cue. They also had to feed the cat every time a certain kind of fish appeared, an event-based cue. Finally, they had to remember to row their boat back to shore when they were done, an activity-based cue. What were the results? Well, for everybody, the activity-based task was the easiest to remember, followed by the event-based with the time-based tasks being the hardest. So what were the results? They found that generally ADHD kids performed similarly to those without a diagnosis. Now, in the event-based task, there was a slight tendency for their performance to get worse over time as the task went on. But that makes sense because for that task, you have to multitask, paying attention to both the fishing that you're doing and noticing when that special fish pops up. In other words, prospective memory failures in ADHD individuals don't seem to be with the memory per se, but instead because of less attention to the reminder cues. If you aren't paying attention to external cues or you're hyper-focused on a different task, which is common in ADHD, you're probably not going to make it to that meeting on time, even though you don't have an issue with memory. One group for which prospective memory is especially important is older individuals. Prospective memory has been shown to be a key predictor of whether someone is able to function independently as they age. This means it's critically important to protect and enhance prospective memory as we get older. Jones, Benge, and Scullin, 2021, published a meta-analysis where they took all of the research on this topic from the past 20 years to see what kinds of interventions were most effective at increasing prospective memory in older adults. They identified four categories of treatment. The first one involved training in memory strategies, like pairing a visual cue with the task to be remembered. Like, when I see this string on my finger, I will remember to take out the trash. Another treatment involved exercising certain cognitive abilities, like working memory. Like a half-hour session where you're shown a series of cards, then you have to recall them in reverse order, and then you get another series, and so on. Some studies used a combination of these strategies, and others relied upon external memory aids, like reminders in your phone. While all of these were effective at boosting prospective memory to some degree, the combination of treatments using multiple methods was actually the least effective. The most effective options were using external memory aids by a long shot. So if you can, get your NAN on a phone plan. <laughs> this also supports the idea that reminder systems can be used for 
all important prospective memory tasks. Sensors in the back seat of cars that send reminder cues to check for kids in the back seat are becoming more widely used and can help save lives. My advice, while you can keep your brain active and healthy using cognitive training and exercising it like a muscle, you can also use the tools you have available to improve your prospective memory. Get into the habit. If it's important, put a reminder in your calendar. Now there's so many other things we could discuss about prospective memory, but maybe I'll remember to do a video about that in the future. <laughs> if you found this video helpful, hit the like button, subscribe to get more content on all things psychology, and until next time, keep thinking. Calendar. I can just check the calendar to figure out what I was supposed to do today. Maybe I was supposed to buy a calendar. <laughs>